Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Um, unlike Mr. Wall, I am afraid that my presentation is absolutely littered with pictures of Lego ulcers. I am not so considerate, so apologies in advance for that. Um, thank you for the introduction. So I work in the emergency vascular clinic. We run a diagnostic uh, leg ulcer service as well as our emergency vascular patients. Um, I also run all of the local anaesthetic uh, superficial venous interventions that we do. Uh, and I'm trained in performing ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Um, so again, this has already been touched on, um, but we know that venous ulceration is a massive, massive problem in the UK at the moment. Um, I'm also going to talk about the EVEREST study. Um, so it showed the importance of uh, superficial venous intervention in improving time to healing. There were two arms. Uh, the first arm was an early intervention group for patients with truncal reflux. Uh, this was treating patients within two weeks. Um, the other arm was treating patients in the deferred arm. It was about six months before they got their treatment. Um, and this showed that the median time to healing for the patients in the early intervention group was only 56 days. However, uh, the EVEREST study only randomized 7% of all of the ulcers that they looked at. Um, they were small ulcers, some might argue easy to heal, they, had, they weren't around for as long, the duration of ulceration was longer, um, and there was still a really high recurrence rate across all groups in this study. So there remains this more complex cohort of patients, um, either with treated um, truncal veins and ongoing ulceration, or competent truncal veins, um, that continue to suffer with venous ulceration despite good compressive therapy and dressings. So, what's the role of foam sclerotherapy and ulcer healing? We know that foam sclerotherapy is an inexpensive intervention. Sub ulcer plexus ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy consists of a direct injection of foam sclerotherapy into the underlying incompetent venous network underneath the ulcer bed. But there's very, although this is widely used in practice, there's very limited evidence to show how we should be utilizing this as a therapy for venous leg ulcers. Uh, in a brief literature review that I undertook, there was kind of a a real paucity of literature. Um, there was a study by Bush in 2013, uh, which was a cohort study of 35 patients. In the absence of truncal reflux, they showed a 90% healing rate at four to six weeks. And this is echoed in a similar order of patients that I've treated at Guys and St. Thomas's, um, similar patient cohort, and we showed 80% healing at six weeks. So, apologies for this wordy slide, um, but we are undertaking a pilot study of sub ulcer plexus foam sclerotherapy at Guys and St. Thomas's. It's a 50 patient consecutive cohort study of patients with venous leg ulcers. We're in only including patients that are compliant with compression, that have treated or competent truncal veins, uh, and excluding kind of arteriovenous uh, mixed etiology ulcers, obviously contraindications to foam sclerotherapy. Um, we're then going to use a control group uh, to match the patients for ulcer size and duration that have been treated with compression only. Um, we'll get these patients retrospectively from the Looper study, which we carried out just before uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, the primary endpoint will be safety of this as a procedure, uh, and then we'll be looking at time to healing with secondary endpoints, including recurrence, um, the role of the concomitant deep veins, uh, quality of life outcome measures, pain scores, and we'll be seeing these patients at baseline, six weeks, 12 weeks, six months, uh, six and 12 months. We're going to be undertaking a full venous duplex uh, at baseline and then another full venous duplex at six months to have a look for residual superficial recurrence. Um, and then we, what we are hoping to do then is to progress this into a randomized control trial. So the reason that we're doing this pilot study is for proof of concept, uh, given how limited the literature is at the moment. Um, and then we want this potential double randomization of potentially um, randomizing people to what we are calling maintenance foam sclerotherapy to look at whether that would reduce recurrence rates in the future. So this is the idea for the RCT. We'll be randomizing patients that have a venous leg ulcers to a saline placebo um, or to get sub ulcer plexus foam sclerotherapy, both groups in compression. There would be a crossover at 12 weeks if patients failed to meet a, a less than 50% reduction in their ulcer surface area. Um, in the intervention arm, we'd be hoping to randomize patients not once, but twice. The first randomization for healing and then a second randomization for occurrence. Um, there'll be an a priori subgroup analysis of the deep veins, so we'll be uh, categorizing the patients into normal deep veins, so patient incompetent, refluxing deep veins, um, or obstructed deep veins. 
So our current practice at Geyser St. Thomas is, this is kind of our superficial um, venous reflux pathway. Uh, the referrals usually come from primary care. Um, they're vetted by the clinical nurse specialist team. Um, based on the quality of the referral, hopefully we can send patients straight for duplex imaging. Um, they'll then get a face-to-face -face review, either by a consultant or a specialist nurse, um, and then we'll book them for intervention. Um, mostly we treat patients in a one-stop way. They are mostly discharged back into the community um, unless they have tissue loss. Our leg ulcer pathway is slightly different. Uh, the patients get booked in directly by the GPs into the nurse-led uh, ulcer service. We then send patients, hopefully for same-day imaging, um, and then book them for intervention. But even, uh, I mean, this is kind of the gold standard of what we were hoping. Um, we have good funding for our leg ulcer service. We have a high number of referrals. We have a big team. Uh, and we still really struggle um, with a lot of um, reasons why patients are suffering from delays. So what are the current barriers to practice? Um, Delays in referrals from primary care is still a huge problem. So the Looper study, which we carried out in about 2020, showed us that the majority of our referrals were coming from GPs, uh, and over 48% of them had already had an ulcer for a year before they got a referral to a specialist service. And as Mr. Wall was saying, you know, this isn't capturing any of the patients that never get a referral at all. There's definitely a lack of understanding of the current evidence and guidance around what the gold standard is for leg ulcers um, and lack of clarity about what the treatment required is, um, which hopefully this research will um, endeavour to answer. At Guys and St. Thomas's, we have problems with same-day scamming, getting imaging, and there's also a problem with continuity of care. Uh, we're a one-stop ulcer clinic. We struggle to see patients more than once because of the volume of patients that we have. Uh, we'll, it's all well and good. We see the patient get a dressing plan in place, send them out to the community, and they're so chronically underfunded, understaffed, that they're not able to continue the dressing plan that we've put in place. We can't get the number of visits that we want, and we, there's a problem with competence and compression in the community. So, I don't have any results for you guys yet from the pilot study, um, but what I have done is put up a couple of case studies from the patients that I've treated recently. Um, so this first gentleman, he was 85 years old, right sided leg ulcers uh, that he had had for five years before he got a referral into a vascular service. They were mixed etiology ulcers. He had a reduced ABPI. We sent him for an angiogram and we did TP trunk angioplasty for him. And at the same time, uh, they did a radiofrequency ablation of his GSV. This was in about October of 2023. Uh, they then referred him into the leg ulcer service. Um, I sent him for a repeat duplex. He had widespread superficial varicosities. And although the ulcers had not got worse, they still hadn't got much better. Um, so I started seeing him for sub plexus foam sclerotherapy. Um, it, it, they were so extensive, his varicosities. It took three sessions. Um, but you can see there that he's now almost healed in the space of about four months. And this gentleman was told, uh, you will live the rest of your life with these leg ulcers. They will never heal. That's what his GP had told him. And we've made massive, massive progress for him. This has significantly reduced the burden of um, community services for this gentleman. He was having three times a week dressings, wasn't able to get to that at his GP service, so was attending urgent care at the weekend to get one dressing done there. That was every week. He's still in compression bandaging, but he is now just having once a week dressings. Um, his quality of life is massively improved. He's back out, out on his allotment. Um, he's over the moon. The second case study, this is a 61-year-old female. She had... Um, left-sided leg ulcers for two years. So we had seen her in November of 2023. Uh, as the Everest study had showed us, we've treated her trunkal reflux and did foam sclerotherapy. Uh, she then was discharged. And then I had an email from her renal physician. So this lady's been on dialysis for the last 18 months. She's not able to go on the renal transplant list until her ulcer is healed. Um, he asked for the prognosis of the leg ulcer. So I brought this patient in for a same-day duplex. She had some residual uh, superficial reflux. Uh, I did sub plexus foam sclerotherapy for her and one month later you can see that that ulcer is already improving. It's made massive progress from where it was. It was completely static beforehand. Um, so to conclude, we know that foam is cheap and effective way to treat superficial venous reflux, but there remains this cohort of patients whose ulcers don't heal despite conventional therapy. Um, 
It's effective in healing venous leg ulcers, but we need more evidence to show how this can be utilized more effectively, not just in healing, but also in recurrence rates. Um, and this potentially provides a cost-effective and easily deliverable therapy for the treatment of leg ulcers. Thank you very much. There's my references and any questions. <laughs> Yeah. Can I ask you, Lily, your definition of um, uh, injecting sub uh, ulcer plexus? Do you inject through the normal skin or the ulcer? Do you use ultrasound guidance? Yes, definitely use ultrasound guidance. And I will aim so uh, to inject in the skin as far away from the ulcer as possible only injecting into the skin that looks healthy. So uh, we, we all, I've also seen anecdotally as sometimes the ulcers get a little bit worse before they get better. Um, so I always prepare patients for that as well. And yes, always ultrasound guidance. What I'm counting as technical success with sub plexus foam sclerotherapy is if I scan the ulcer afterwards and I can see with the ultrasound machine that I've got good distribution of foam underneath the ulcer bed. Every meeting I've ever been to on venous disease says perforating veins are bad for you. So what do you do with perforating veins? Um, the evidence for treating perforators is so patchy um, that at Guys and St. Thomas's we don't treat perforators at all. So ignore them. <laughs> One more and then we'll move on because we're a bit late. Just a short question. Do you have any compression standards for these patients? One layer, two layers, or on a boot? Maybe I missed from your presentation. Say that again, sorry. Uh, do you have any compression, uh, the, the dressings, the, the compression for the, the leg? Do, do, do you have a standard for that? Do you have standardized it, uh, the compression? Yes, yeah, so we well, I will always aim Or to use compression stockings or something. Yeah, always bandages for patients with ulcers, um, as long as they can manage to have bandaging done. Um, and it, I will always aim to put them in the highest amount of compression possible based on their ABPI. Uh, the question. How, when you do your, when you recommend to go back to the community, how do you do it? Because we, we've got a, like a compression passport we give them which they can ignore. Well, how do you vote? Uh, we write clinic letters, so I'll write a clinic letter, send it to the district nurses, and then I write a dressing plan, print it, and give it to the patient so that they have a copy, paper copy, in their house to show to the district nurses when they come round. I do wonder whether or not a universal compression passport, which we could give all the patients, which was NHS-led, would be useful. Yeah, sounds fantastic. That's a chatty isn't it? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much.